live. We're, we're live now. Hello and welcome to the final session uh, in the series that we've been holding um, of debates about architecture today. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce two figures who I think uh, are the right of the heart of things today, um, Patrick Schumacher and Wolf Pricks. Um, and the title that we've, we've chosen, or the theme, um, is something that comes from, from uh, one of Wolf, Wolf's concerns. Um, the theme, um, I, I've used my own words, but uncertain ground, um, the, the future of the profession of architecture in the post-pandemic era. Wolf is always talking about how the old structures are beginning to sort of fall away and new structures are emerging. Well, what exactly is happening? Um, to my mind, there are two key game changers in the last year or so. One has been COVID itself that has forced architecture to adjust in many ways. And the second one has been the introduction of new technologies, um, AI, blockchain, and so on. So today uh, we'll get, we have a chance to see some of the the, some of the stunning work that's been produced, but also some of the ideas that lie behind um, these uh, very progressive practices, um, Co-op and uh, um, as a Hadid Architects. Um, let me just say a few words um, by way of introduction. I, I mo in, in this case, of course, neither of our, our guests needs in any in introduction, but I think they obviously deserve something. And with Wolf, I want to say, first of all, I want to say simply two words of thank you. Thank you for um, what you've done in the past, as I, I'm internally grateful for the intervention of Karl Pimmelblau back in the, whenever it was, the late 80s, early 90s, really invigorating architecture and, and saving us from the clutches of postmodernism and introducing a, an incredibly new dynamic and inspiring um, new kind of uh, language of architecture forms. Um, secondly, I want to thank Wolf for, for recognizing Wolf, uh, Daniel Bolajan. I mean, who is somebody who's been part of our team and uh, is incredibly modest about what he does, but extremely talented. And uh, to, for your, to, you to support him and to, to help produce uh, to, to, to produce the Deep Himmelblau project that has been so influential is really quite a remarkable um, uh, co contribution in many ways. Um, Wolf, I should just mention, apart from being the, the, in charge of Corp Himmelblau, had an incredibly important role uh, educationally um, in, uh, in with Angavanta, where he brought in people like Zahadid, Zahadid and, and Sanford Quinta, who is part of our um, our group today, um, and really made uh, Vienna for a while the center of things. Um, and someone else, of course, who was involved there was Patrick, as is, is Patrick Schumacher, um, who is in fact supervising Daniel Bolagen right now uh, for a PhD at Angavanta. Patrick is um, somebody who, again needs no introduction. But what I always think is worth saying is is the sheer energy that Patrick puts into to everything, teaching in all over the world, um, especially for digital futures, where he is a PhD supervisor also, um, writing books that are longer than than Rem Kool has, and running an office of 400 plus people, which is quite astonishing, frankly. Um, the sheer energy um, of which uh, that Patrick has put into this is really quite astonishing. So it's a really a great privilege today. The idea really is to have some, a couple of presentations, but then to really get into some discussion um, between the group here as well um, about what is happening today in architecture and how do we need to reassess what's happening? What are the old structures that are falling away and what are the new structures that are emerging? Um, so I'd like to call upon Patrick, first of all, to um, who's sharing his screen now, to, to um, uh, to say a few words about uh, his outlook on the politically smart city. Patrick, <laughs> welcome. Right, right. Thanks a lot again for giving me a platform and it's great to have Wolf here and see what we make of the, the current state of architecture. So, um, yeah, the smart city has been banded about and it's usually, you know, the smart technologies uh, in the smart energy grids and of course, uh, various smart systems. Um, and I think we also need to think of it as smart, politically smart and planning smart, but also calling that means economically smart and architecturally smart. And uh, what does that mean? And that means in all respects, yes, uh, the involvement of new technological processes and methodologies, but it means more than that. So I have these three aspects I want to talk about in terms of the smart city government, the market and architecture. And all three are contributing, I think, uh, and each contributing with the, by being guided discursively as well through public, academic, and professional discourse to what we might call the good city, the good life. So the built environment for me has always been about and is about ordering of social processes. And these social processes are processes of you know, cooperation. And you know, that's the prosperity engine uh, we all kind of uh, cherish. And I'm showing this image 
this is Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan, the state. And basically there's this kind of metaphoric image of the social body, the body politic, where, where we, we have this kind of cooperative integration and let's say functional differentiation of all uh, uh, people in, in the social body. But on the frontispiece of that book, you see uh, the real physical manifestation and best visualization of this is, is actually the form of the city, at least up to a certain point. And now we have, of course, virtual systems overlaying that, but that still remains um, the, uh, let's say the image of society become manifest in space. So, but we no longer have these kind of neat uh, easy to be surveyed cities, you know, surrounded by a wall. We have this kind of massive megalopolis uh, urban conurbations. But what is driving the recent wave of, of urban concentration? That's, and I've been talking about a lot, is that uh, shift from fortism to post fortism based on computational empowered and telecommunication empowered uh, new ways of, of interaction, research development, production. And so we're going from this world, which by the way, was quite presciently anticipated by, by, by Lecobis in 1924, that image became the reality in the next decade. And uh, that was killed. And then we have a totally new world. So we were, the, you know, the, let's say the last uh, instantiation of this world is maybe Brasilia. And now, uh, you know, I showed you Moscow 1990 before, sorry, he, right here on the right. And this is a new Moscow, which is, but it's happening all over the world. It's kind of incredible intensification, but also this incredible, let's say, visual chaos and, and uh, collage city, which which was also already named in the in, in the 70s. So that's London. It's a totally new world uh, of architecture, and all the people who've been locked in these kind of suburban um, assembly lines are now kind of aggregating in the city centers and um, participating in this dynamic ecosystem of the knowledge economy, research development, marketing, and basically the, the, this new technological system that can absorb so much innovation because it's just about reprogramming the robots, updating and uploading a, a new uh, software as service. This infinitely absor absorption of creativity means everybody can and should become a creative innovator and contributor. So that's a new kind of city, the super brain for these processes and, uh, you know, if I'm, as you know, I've been looking a lot at, 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 at the buildings of these um, corporations who are central, but also now as kind of hubs and co-working hubs, et cetera. You can see here the shift from these kind of rigid zoned uh, structures, both in the city and in the buildings to something much more fluid dynamic, layered, uh, uh, complex. And we need these kind of integration, three-dimensional integration with intervisibility, intervenous, in these buildings and that's uh, the background I'm throwing up in the back as well because we, we're having these, um, very, really this is an absolute super large uh, building and envelope uh, these this massive mega plates. And, but yet, you know, trying to find orientation with it, we lay, we, we're raising all the corridors so you overlook where you're moving and you can see people moving on an elevated level, the different techniques and of course all these sexual breakthroughs to, to, to have orientation in, in the face of this kind of level of complexity. Uh, we've done it before in, in, in other small buildings. So, but the same thing applies to the city. And it's quite interesting. The city of London is that amazing global financial hub. So these agglomeration, let's say, um, processes, basically they're based on network effects. And network effects we know, of course, through, through all these technological platforms, but the city has also based on network effects. That's why only the large cities are, you know, sucking up everybody. Um, and, and, and smaller cities are, are kind of emptying out. It's a co-location synergies, of course, for consumers where everything shared facilities, but most importantly, business to business collaboration networks, integrated labor markets, deep and liquid, career development is only possible in these large centers, labor mobility. And then you have, not, you have these economies of scope, myriads of niche market, this very long tail of provision, which also is of course uh, ha you now happening kind of digitally as well for both consumers and businesses. So, um, and in this kind of new world, that kind of dynamics sprawling or, uh, you know, swarming and, and intensified swarming, there's a complexity barrier and a massive knowledge problem for any central urban planning. So 
So I think we need to rethink how the that the role is of government, what the role is of market, what the what, what architecture is, to 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 maintain that good city, that good life. So the government, I think, should be mostly a legal order, and maybe a little bit more. I'll come to that. Um, the market is actually taking over to sort out the land use order and the programmatic order. Let's say. Uh, how the, all the various use cases and how they should find each other, network each other up, that's the client's task. Um, and uh, then architecture is actually making that programmatic, otherwise hidden order legible through an aesthetic order. That's the way I see the division of labor here. So if you're talking about government, I go very, very quickly, rule of law, you know, clearly defined property rights, infrastructure, yes. Uh, because private ventures need, there's construction cost barriers, uh, so transaction cost barriers, sorry. And but then very important to defend development, stand firm against any form of nimbyism. What I see the government happening now, uh, doing a lot is prevention, you know, freezing up, paralyzing these, these, these cities. Uh, and then I think instead of planning, it's just forward guidance to, to catalyze somehow market-based self-organization. Um, so how much planning? How much is that forward guidance? Uh, and um, well, I think uh, I will jump over this quickly, but what, what my recommendation is to, to not have one system so that the, each city in different districts should have various different regimes. Yes, in the central, in the central part, maybe there's some kind of sponsored order, something to, similar to a master plan or a review board or some rule-based conditions. Other districts you could really leave over to the, the various developers and landowners have some kind of self-governing order to, to rewrite the rules collectively. There is some collective action necessity because you have some negative externalities you need to control. And then there should be districts which are totally free, absolutely freewheeling, um, spontaneous order. So there's top down, meso level and bottom up, central planning. And the second one that's kind of self-governing order is I call it private planning. And then there should be zones where there's absolutely no planning, I believe. And you can learn a lot probably there, which you then use the lessons to then curate and, and, and streamline what was discovered there. So um, there is an, an, an idea which I have here to, to, in terms of this kind of private planning that you could privatize planning. So in, in, you know, in, if you have London, you have all these borrowers, you have the central government. So, so I think these, these borrowers are doing a horrible job. They, they, they actually, it's mostly prevention and paralyzing. I think it's, I'm saying this, this post COVID, it's extremely important to free that up, to open it up because there's so much restructuring, so much uncertainty about which models uh, might work, how to reuse all these empty office building. You know, will people wanna be moving back in the city? Will there be, will there be a lot of, uh, you know, public infrastructure usage, commuting, I mean, there is so much up in the air so that there's the only way <laughs> you need the discovery process of freedom, of free entrepreneurship. And that's why I'm saying privatized planning. So you could have, so if, you know, some district leave it just to the kind of um, freewheeling self-organization, but that if there is planning, it should be franchised out. So the, plan, the city's planning authority could be handed over to private planning corporations or firms who feel up to it for 50 years franchises and they can then run these districts planning regimes and they would in a sense the planning gains would become uh, their uh, their their revenue and i'm i'm just showing you this that there was this kind of system the great estates of london they had private planning so these are the you know the grosvenor state the cadogan estate bedford estate etc so that's the way london was developed in the 18th century and 19th century through these private land holdings, they were, you know, they have a kind of value creation process. And they, because this was a leasehold system, it first was 25 year leases, 50 year leases, 100 leases, the properties come back and is a continuously value management through these competing districts, the great estates, as I said, you know, around Bloomsbury here, uh, the Bedford estate or the Grosvenor estate around uh, um, Mayfair or the Cadogan estate that is Barbravia, Chelsea, et cetera. So you have these parallel models. I think that's incredibly successful. These are fantastically robust and beautiful cities. Of course, that didn't continue. That's frozen up now because all these um, 
great estates, they lost their planning powers and this has been handed over to democratic government. And I think that th there's massive problems with that in terms of the paralysis, I think. But there was this lucky accident of history, this, the, the city of London, meaning the financial district, the so-called square mile, where there's an unbelievable dynamism and you know, piling in on a fantastic buildings. It's the city of London corporations, in a sense, the last enclave of a kind of quasi-private planning because there's very few residents here, 7,000 residents, uh, voting residents. And then there's the, the, the firms, they have voting delegates. So there's about, there's 32,000 uh, uh, corporate voting delegates, uh, you know, uh, and they're kind of, in a sense, that's that negotiated, self-managed, business-managed um, 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 district, which is incredibly thriving. And it's actually also beautiful. It, it has managed to maintain all the beautiful uh, historic alleys and jewels and buildings like the, the, the old Bank of England, et cetera, and even kind of uh, more ancient structures all mixed in with this, with it, in, this in, in the city. So, so that's the, I think my model of governance uh, through these uh, private planning uh, uh, forms. Um, so markets, markets, uh, you know, uh, you know, they're marvels. I mean, you have this, pr the price system is a kind of telecommunication system of all the scarcities and all the desires and computed in, in through this kind of bidding processes, which is an absolute irreplaceable information processing mechanism. And, uh, and particularly the, competitive market process and it's also discovery process. This is all this trial and error and quick weeding out. If you have a, if you have an idea, you try it out, you try to sell a plan, you don't, you, you're out, uh, you're bust and somebody else can take over. So there's a churning and discovery process. And that's what we don't find in the political process. So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and th these co-location synergies, they're so complex now. You have a complex side, the entrepreneur, the company where you should settle in, they should be able to choose which site and where to connect up to. And if there's a site, you should be able to, free to, as an owner of a site, to, to generate that, that use mix, which makes the most of the surrounding, let's say, affiliations. Because that's why you're coming to the city in the first place, because of these co-location synergies. And if you have a frozen, some kind of arbitrary imposition, imposed plan about what each parcel should be, uh, 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 locate, be allowed to locate there, then you, you kill that whole process. And, and if you let the market run, you get beautiful kind of value landscapes like this, except they wouldn't be so, so rugged and so, so steep because right now, because of all this paralysis and lack of supply and density restrictions, you have actually the value skyrocketing instead of the buildings coming up, uh, 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 ameliorating the, that, that process. So, and, and I think I don't want to go too much into this, but I mean, what happened in the last, you know, that urban renaissance, so there is a push into the city, but with this, at the same time, nimbyism paralysis, prices just skyrocket and kill that process and slow the process down. And you see that what, what this is the, um, the, the, the percentage of pure land value over, over construction has been mushrooming up. And uh, you can see that here. Also as part of GDP, it's, it, it, it it's, it's two times, you know, the, the value locked in land. So that means inequality uh, and, and inefficiency at the same time. And, and it, it makes nearly unlivable. So the, the amount of uh, the percentage of your income you have to pay for accommodation has been kind of rising and rising and rising, fivefold, sixfold. So that now people who need to live in the city, they, they you know, they give up like, many of my staff, our staff, about 80% of their, of their salary to have a kind of miserable, <laughs> miserable home <laughs> because of these strange kind of um, uh, politically distorted market processes. And that's a real, that's a prosperity killer. And it's also an inequality generator. So massive loss of prosperity, massive contribution to wealth inequality with this kind of um, um, uh, processes. So the market must be allowed to function in real estate and urban development. And that's for the sake of general prosperity and social justice. So now architecture, as I said, the task is here to, if you presume these very complex, intricate co-location 
self-organizing processes, then the architect needs to take this in and make these, uh, translate these into spaces, into morphologies, into to, to articulate and make legible all these connections and relationships. It's an intensive system of relations. That's in a sense, parametricism is ideal. You can script all these dependency networks and then you, you basically overcoming that uh, dichotomy. We're not going back to a monotony, we, but we can also make that chaos legible. So there's this, currently this paradox of homogenization, homogenization via too much difference. So you get this kind of strange, illegible, menacing garbage spill because there is, we, we as a discipline, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are so fragmented and we don't have an ethos of uh, embedding structures and, and, and establishing and weaving continuities as well as we don't have a proper market process which, 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 which gives us the underlying programmatic order, which we need to, um, let's say, um, make legible and turn into an aesthetic order. But if you look back at these kind of city spills, what, what shows up is the only orienting structures are the, the, the natural features, the big rivers, the, the, the hills, the valleys, they give order and structure to, to an urban entity. The spill itself, very, very little. And that's what you find everywhere. So we're looking at these models of um, rule-based, complex, differentiated structures as formal models, as inspirations for uh, city space and city fabric development. So these are the early sketches we've developed for these kind of um, urban fabrics, which are um, differentiated, uh, the complex, they're layered, but at the same time, they maintain a legibility in the face of this complexity. So these are kind of parametric urbanism models at Zahadid Architects at AADRL, but they were still too uh, unified, not complex, and not, 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 not rich enough. And we've done that also in, 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 in various cities, smart cities and models, you know, making them the, the making the blocks porous, layering the, the, um, the, the, the functions, atria and bridges and so on. These topics, we've done that. And we're doing them in, 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 in China, a lot of these urban districts. But uh, so I think that we're trying our best within a single firm to generate richness, variety, complexity, uh, and maintain legibility and unity. But I think that comes to its limit if it's, it's only kind of single hand, I mean, they're getting larger and larger, <laughs> single hand projects. We need, to all, we need to go beyond that and have this multi-author, multi-species multi ecology where, where we have larger city it, it building up uh, where various authors and various firms uh, work together. And I'm only, I can't show you these cities yet. <laughs> I can only show you analogs, uh, metaphors, inverted commas, or let's say, in the middle of metaphors, they're, they're kind of working analogies of multi-species ecology, the way you get differentiation and, and, but also you get gradients and you get integration and you get legibility because these things are correlated. Uh, topography is correlated with, with and, and, and closeness to water, uh, direction of sun, all of these parametric factors, they have, a, they have a kind of scripted impact. And that's why these territories are not garbage spills. And if you throw something randomly at this, it will pop out at not being systematic. However rich it is, it is not garbage spill. It is something else. And we're trying to generate these urban models in the way we have multiple students working together. And this is kind of 15 or 12 students working on a single project, each doing their part. And if they go in the newest, they're quite different tectonic systems, but they share sort of principles and they share the, um, the ethos of generating resonances and affiliations. And you can see if you go close, it's very rich, it's diverse, but it's also paradigmic under one paradigm, under one epochal style, which has a lot of internal riches and differentiation. So you get something quite, quite uh, beautiful and quite harmonious. And I start, and I've done that a number of times. So we tried that with various studios. Um, um, so to do something on a larger territory with more authors. So this is, um, uh, you know, four projects, each one, two, three, four, each with four authors, so 16 authors. And they started, they all started independent to work up ideas, concepts, and then there's an integration and affiliation 
and mutual, um, let's say, connection game to get that new London. That, that location is, by the way, between the city of London, that fantastic, that menacing model uh, of super high density, and then the Canary Wharf, which is a much more sterile corporate axial condition. But anyway, in between, we have, we have all these relatively uh, uh, less intense areas. And so, so these are the models. You can see the layering of the ground, uh, the various, you know, you know, many different functions, many different models, types of towers, uh, atria, bridges. And by the way, it's all topology optimization structurally. So there was a set of state-of-the-art underlying methodological principles to develop that. And I don't have you have the, these kind of structural technical uh, studies here. I'm just showing you final results of how one could imagine this. And it really depends on something we couldn't have done in the office. It really depends that you have 16 different authors starting, uh, exploring, and then kind of trying to weave it in that you need a whole year instead of the usual kind of uh, you know six weeks to develop something which is has 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 quite intensity. Of course, the, the models are also in terms of towers take the core out, pull the core away like we're doing as well, uh, have, a, have a skeleton which allows you to freely um, throw in um, uh, elevators and, and, and plates which are non, not structurally uh, tied in with the system. So, and then of course, working with the waterways and crossing the water and so on. So I think there's a nice range of, of uh, districts um, and, and interesting towers with all the, this porosity and layeredness of connecting up because I believe, and then, well, I'll give you a few visions and images. You also see that with, with the, um, the, the productivity we, we've now, uh, you know, able to, 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 to what we can achieve uh, even, even starting with, with, with a new bunch of students uh, within, within uh, one year. So, and to have the variety. So these are steel structures, we have timber structures, concrete structures, uh, different types of topology optimization. We are really pushing variety and unity at the same time. So, um, So I'm just uh, flying through some of these, these, these images. So that's the vision of, of the new London. So I still believe in hyperdensity in, 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 in urban concentration. And of course, there's a whole other discourse where I still believe in what we're doing now that there's a lot of virtual overlays, uh, cyberspace overlays. And so I believe in, in urban concentration with cyber overlays and then you have, and, and, but taking out some of the commuting. So there's, there, there's a lot of residential structures integrated. So we have, we have a chance to have the walkable city, the hyperdense integrated city. And now with, with looking at, you know, e-bikes and e-scooters, you know, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers is, is, is no problem. I don't think we need to, um, uh, we, we can imagine an electric car free pedestrianized, active travel, uh, a mega city, I mean, but hyper dense uh, to, 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 to get this uh, urbanity going on a new level. So that's the thesis. Thanks, Patrick. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a, a, a huge provocation. I think it'll be interesting discussion coming up afterwards. Uh, um, maybe Wolf, are you are you ready to share your screen yet? Or yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, uh, I have to say that I love Patrick. <laughs> I really like him because this was a great election speech for the uh, the the mayor of London. <laughs> and uh, and it, if he will be elected, I hopefully will be invited because I want to see <laughs> Para Patrick on the chair of the mayor of uh, London and the whole world. A little bit Platoismus is in his speech. Plato, who wants to have the perfect society, <laughs> and 
And uh, Para Patrick is going for that since I know him. Yeah, he is looking for a perfect society which is ruled by the laws of Patrick Schumacher. <laughs> 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 Patrick, this is the way it is. So uh, it's okay. And what I like on uh, Patrick is that he is a theorist, but he is willing as well. I don't know what his theory, you know, these big books where uh, um, I didn't read it because it's too complicated. I need a dictionary next to my, to this book to translate all this complicated and um, uh, really um, uh, creative words. Um, anyway, but uh, it's very important that he, he is, in this scene and steers up the, let's say, this uh, neoliberalism thinking uh, of the city. It's one branch of uh, upcoming development. Mm -hmm. But um, the discussion nowadays is, I am afraid that the, our land, the architectural country is occupied by people you uh, uh, easily, uh, the real estate people and the marketing people and the political guys, they're using our terms, but they interpret it in a different way. You know, architect, the architect of the contract, uh, Helmut Kohl, the architect of this contract between Russia and uh, Kazakhstan. All these guys are architects, but they are not architects. They are political guys. So what I mean is we, if we don't fight to get back the meaning of the word architecture and space, we just talking in a different way and we are equal to all these guys who have no idea what real architecture is, namely to improve our uh, um, environment in many ways, uh, technical, economically, and so forth and so forth. Um, what should I show? Well, I have to share the screen uh, to answer with slides to Patrick's uh, theory. Uh, hold on a second. Just while, while we're waiting for, for Wolf, I just want to mention that um, we will have some questions uh, in the chat. So if you have any questions, please forward them and uh, we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, Patrick, can I just ask you that the, the, you, you didn't mention the building in the background that you showed is in Moscow. Yeah. So what right. is it exactly? So it's a technology center for Sperbank. Sperbank is a big bank, the, the biggest bank in, in, in Russia. And uh, like a lot of banks, Sberbank as well, I mean, they become nearly software companies with all the te technical system and software systems. Uh, so it's a software development um, center for Sberbank. And what, what? So it's like a big tech, a big tech hub. Okay. And what stage is it at now? Is, is it? Typically? This is under construction. Okay. Good. Okay, Wolf, we can see your screen now. Yeah. <laughs> Everything okay? Yeah. Yeah, but you know, when I, uh, I was preparing this lecture for the last time, so uh, it's not specially for this discussion, but um, I refer actually to, in this thing, to my two dreams I ever had. The first dream is when we started Himmelblau 55, 55 years ago, we wanted to change this rigid thinking of the architectural process dramatically. We want to have it more radical and more in immediately. Um, from now up to then, um, seeing the, the thing is was very naive, but this is the right of every young uh, guy architects to uh, try the, to, to make naivete to a 
main issue of the development of his own way to think about spaces. We had the dream to change and push the envelope of the architectural discussion and we wanted to build um, buildings which are flexible and buoyant like clouds. Um, I think through the AI possibilities, we are close to that. And this dream I have now is using the AI as a co-worker in condensing the process of planning so that we have more uh, time to think about uh, new innovations. What, I'll, what, I, what could I learn from the AI is not to use it as a imagination for, for the new a language, uh, but, but using it as a co-worker uh, who makes the slavery job of our job, the slavery part of our job, namely to, uh, um, uh, to, to plan in detail and uh, get through with it by, uh, with the building companies. Um, so my dream now is that when a, um, um, a project comes in, um, I, uh, we get the program, we make the program model and give it to our co-worker Ada, because we call the architecture um, uh, artificial intelligence not artificial, but we call it architectural intelligence and therefore we call it Ada um pointing out that Ada Lovelace was uh, one of the first human being who developed this way of thinking in the computer uh, world. Um, Ada one takes it and the whole office goes to the next bar and next morning we come in and Ada had prepared the first step then we in the model and plans and then we make a short evaluation and give it to the other two, which is connected uh, with the other team and other uh, ecological way of thinking. And then our whole office is going to the Maldives and has holidays for three weeks, uh, three months. Then we come back and the project is finished. This is my ultimate dream because I'm too old to be a politician like, uh, uh, or a mayor like uh, Patrick will do. Sooner or later, he will run a big, big city planning um, office in, in maybe in Sao Paulo or, or in London. I don't think so in London, but Sao Paulo would be a great stuff for him. By the way, uh, uh, when I see that this fabulous project of the students, uh, Patrick showed us, um, I was thinking, I'm looking to a big car shop. There are different, uh, different um, uh, brands, different things, Audi and BMW. It looks, but they look very similar from far ahead. If you go there, then you see the difference. This is one thing I have to, um, I would like to discuss it because I don't know whether this is the, the a way we can go using all, all the same programs. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the cities I like um, are more chaotic, uh, but this is a personal view and has nothing to do with the, uh, the, the power of facts. By the way, I have to say, I can see a lot of difference between architects coming from different cultures. This is my theory, yeah? Uh, um, um, we are, we talk in the same way, but we are very different in the, in the outcome. Like, um, you know, uh, the Catholic, Baroque way of thinking of Austrian architects, like uh, 
translated into the into nowadays, like Dominic or Abraham or us, is very different in the approach and the process than uh, the Dutch guys, Ram or MVR, the Far Winnie Pooh, um, or the Calvinistic German guys uh, are very different, or the Spanish guy, very, very concentrated on, on the Jesuit uh, um, attitude, or the American and my Jewish friend, uh, they are more chaotic in terms of arg argument, um, argumentation for their projects, uh, like uh, Eric Moss or, 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 or Frank Gehry and Glibeski, the, the, the language of them. And Saha, uh, like I'm, when I met her, she always, all their first projects, not now because the, uh, Patrick is developing that in a very, very straight and very, very impressive way, the language of Saha. Um, um, Saha's uh, building look like, um, like a calligraphy of, of Arabic science. So there is a big, big difference in the approach and the outcome is uh, the difference in the approach, but the wording is almost the same. I could do the same lecture of um, Patrick with my words. And, uh, but it, it, if I show them my projects, it's, it looks very different. And this is the variety maybe Patrick was meaning. I don't know how I can go ahead. Yeah, doesn't work. I don't know. Sorry, that's Just work. the bottom and click on the, the screen icon at the bottom. Um, yeah. <laughs> can, can you please? You know what? Uh, I forgot. To, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, so no. this is it. Yeah, yeah. So this was the explanation of my first dream. And this is the, the second dream. So we only make the, the first step in the project by analyzing different, uh, different um, uh, approaches. Um, but then the other, the architecturally intelligent partner takes over and then we may be uh, able to build and make it movable like that. So I'm not too old to dream. I'm too old to be a, a politician because I know it's a very tough job and um, I really admire, admire Patrick that's, that he is daring to go this way. <laughs> Sooner or later. Can you um, share the screen, which is, means the icon at the bottom right with the screen on so we... Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Um, English. It's further down. It's yeah, further yeah. down. You mean for oh, screen? Oh, no, no. no, I don't want to uh, go into the, the whole thing um, uh, okay. too much. So this is concentrated, uh, concentrated on, on building. What I criticize uh, um, um, on the situation right now, there's many people um, are going along the power of facts. I think this is a very Dutch way. Uh, this uh, is always, um, um, I think Ram is doing, and now I can see at, uh, Vera Patrick's theory, uh, the power of facts is okay, but my, my imagination of being an architect is not only take the uh, constraints, but bend it and bend it in a way uh, which opens up uh, uh, the, the, the building as an icon for an open society and 
I say building only becomes architecture if it reaches the meta level in, in form or content construction of material. I mean, when the building has one gestalt. So this is uh, the, the, the image you uh, referred to, um, Neil, that I said, we are, we are living on a uh, uncertain ground where our society is living on a very uncertain ground. And the old, uh, the old um, uh, structures are dying, but they are not dead yet. You can see that everyone is discussing what, uh, what kind of changes we will have. Um, so I can feel, and then many other people are in the economy, studying the political, uh, political um, um, development, that the old structures are going down, but they're not dead yet. The new structures are coming up, but they're not born yet. And what the young people and the schools can do, they can invent things, thinking about possibilities which are not uh, be able to realize it now, but in the future, maybe they should uh, influence the upcoming new structures. Otherwise, the old structures will dive in through and will come uh, disguised as a new kind of way of thinking um, um, in, in, in the future. Um, anyway, so um, this is what I wanted to say. And therefore my question, <laughs> this is uh, just for Patrick. Um, he works with that also every day. This is the brief of the client. <laughs> and this is the client budget. And we have to maneuver in between uh, to uh, get, uh, get theories built. I would, I would love to, to, to say that in that way. Uh, what I, uh, uh, maybe you know that, that the discussion about architecture is uh, like uh, evaluation of this iceberg. We only talk about the visible things and uh, the critics don't know the process of the upcoming of this reality uh, because the invisible part is the much more dangerous. And uh, I think what uh, uh, Patrick just showed, this is a part of this invisible part of architecture, his theory about the politics and the architecture and whatsoever. And, um, and, um, and we all know that the invisible part, the politics, the economic issues, the, 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 the development of the society, these are much more dangerous. We could see that on the Titanic where <laughs> Titanic was uh, broken by the invisible part of the iceberg. And the same is with architecture. And I really, really are angry about critics who are talking about this visible part and have no idea what's going on in the invisible part in uh, what we have to do in order to realize this visible part. It, 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 for me, it looks like we architects, Patrick, me, and all the others, we are swimming in the stream of a very, very heavy, heavy uh, river. Yeah, heavy stream in the river. And the critics and the theorists are standing on the river bench and call us and say, and they tell us what we had, uh, what we should do. Yeah, without getting wet, they know how, what we are, they, they think they know what we have to suffer when we are fighting for surviving in the middle of a turbulence. Yeah. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, so the other issue is, this is for sure architecture, everyone agrees. But look at the look at the, um, uh, the program. <laughs> the program is the, are the right volumes here. If you go to a client nowadays and say, "Okay, 
this is uh, your program and this is architecture. I think you uh, uh, will get fired in seconds. <laughs> so yeah, this is just one thing, complex systems. The, uh, this is not critique uh, on uh, Patrick's uh, theory, but I know that complex systems uh, trigger complex problems and these complex problems can only be solved by complex, um, uh, uh, sorry, by complex systems, problems, complex solutions. The disadvantage of complex solutions is that they are almost not understandable. It's very complicated, complicated, to um, argue with complex solution because no one is ready and able to follow you. Like the philosophy of Patrick. <laughs> People are going for simple solutions. It's clear when you say foreigners out of our country, everyone says, oh, I understand that. Complex solutions, but the advantage of the complex solutions is that complex solutions are always new. Simple solutions are always old. And this is, um, for instance, this the dream, yeah, everyone knows that. Um, I have to... Um, this is Michelangelo, the 16 chapel. And uh, when we uh, got, uh, got to know the uh, parametric and the uh, these uh, digital advantages we are dreaming of, of freedom on every level. My, my students were, were completely convinced that, that this is in the 90s, that this is the solution for freedom and uh, information freedom, freedom for everything. I have to admit that I was always a little bit skeptical because my experience is going the other direction. And of course, nowadays it's uh, like that. We know that. I don't want to discuss that because it's clear. So um, I'm jumping over to some projects, not going into detail. We developed a lot of methods from 68 to now from uh, believing that the deconstructive theory is not a theory of shapes and forms and how they put together, but it's going deeper. It's going to, uh, uh, to the, 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 the ground of Derrida's um, investigation about the subconscious and finding the blind spot, um, which is of course related to the Freud, uh, which was the teacher of, or Derrida was the student of Freud, and the blind spot is the point of departure uh, of uh, evaluation, uh, eluva, evaluating the whole text, uh, says um, the blind spot in every painting, music piece, text, is written, painted, or composed in an unconscious moment. And this blind spot is ruling the whole text. And we thought, okay, if we can, if we can um, as liberate from the constraints of the theory and the facts and constraints of architecture, then maybe we can find the moment where we can liberate space. It is a very uh, theoretical, um, theoretical uh, 
approach, um, by the way. And so we developed this uh, method in a, a completely um, uh, other direction. Then we got tools like the space arm, uh, the 3D scanner, and now we are la landed, so to say, with the enormous help and intelligence of um, Daniel, uh, we are landed in the field of the artificial, of the architectural intelligence. So uh, when we were talking about uh, the, the coincidence and mistakes in architecture, which are the driving point for many of our thoughts and details, um, uh, then uh, I have to rem remind you on the, on the, uh, on the black dot of a, of a butterfly. Uh, how does the black dot, uh, dot, black dot of the butterfly comes on the wings? of the butterfly? Is it calculation? Is it a big master who paints it on the... No, it's by its uh, existing, like, uh, like all evolutionary things are coming up, up like that by coincidence. And if it's good, it stays. If it's bad, it's, uh, it's uh, disappearing. So what I want to <laughs> show you uh, rem you uh, remember on the fortissimus line of Parapatrick, where the, the cars are done by hand. This is our office. <laughs> and now it may be in the future will look like our office in 10 years, 15 years, it will look like that. But uh, meanwhile, we are producing a lot of architectural bits and, bits and pieces, this mocape um, thing is one of my favorite building we did because it's, um, I would say in a very, very secretly way, uh, here comes Borromini and uh, Piranesi together without using their language. And I have to say, and Daniel is always saying that the, uh, the, the, the same way, we are not housing foreign projects in our universe for the um, AI. We only quote our build it or not build it project. So we are not copying Gothic facades and overlaid with other things, or oh, we are not copying uh, city plans and, and overlaid with uh, uh, other city plans in order to find something. No, no, we are only using our, our material. And that we can, should build uh, with, uh, with robots in order to get uh, complex situations or complex building economic wise on the right track. Uh, just a short.
So you may, uh, may uh, um, I made a long story short, but this is for sure the future elements we have to use in our uh, to realize the complex things. At the at the very end, uh, I would like to show you the project we are working on right now. Namely, it's the book about our uh, the book about our city planning issues where we sh for sure um, uh, you will use the AI. Um, a friend of mine, maybe Patrick, you know him, Wolf Singer is uh, very, uh, he, is, he is a very famous brain research, uh, researcher and said, if you uh, you can learn a lot about city planning, if you look at the brains, uh, the, the 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 organization of our brain, you will never reach the complexity. But the point of departure could be the same. This is what we are investigating now. And the other thing is the ecological approach uh, is that we re replace for a project in Vienna, um, the building lines by the energy lines. And, no? Hey. Yeah. And a three-dimensional master plan came up. And this is what we are working on. And at this, um, uh, Daniel, we have to put in our universe as well, because that shows that this only the three dimensional master plans could help us to overcome the problems we have now um, in, in our urban plan. And by the way, I, I don't believe that uh, that intelligent architects, architecture exists or that the intelligent, uh, intelligent, smart city exists. Intelligent and smart are only the architects. I never saw an intelligent city who is polite or not polite, greeting me if I arrive at the airport. I never saw a building says, good morning, Mr. Briggs. This would be, then I would admit that the building is intelligent. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Wolf, that was, that was great, thank you. thank you. Yeah, this is what we, this is what we are working on and uh, this uh, only AI will be able to help us to get through with all the facts and um, uh, rules and regulation. Okay. So I don't know how I can get out of this screen sharing. Yeah, Daniel, can you can you help? Keep it away, Daniel. If you want to show the show the, the Himmelblau universe, so the master. Oh. <laughs> so just give me a second. You know, I'm from the generation who likes the computer but cannot handle it. <laughs> because it's too uh, cons uh, it's concentration wasting to learn and remember all the moves you can do. My kids can do it. So mm -hmm. I'm hopefully that, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Daniel, do you, you can show something, something Daniel? Daniel? I don't think we have. I don't think we have something prepared for that, so uh, I think we should just keep it there to the presentation of Mr. Briggs. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so let's let's. Um, <laughs> that was interesting. To, in a way, um, 
I mean, beautiful architecture, no question, but uh, different approaches in some senses. Um, I, I, I was, I, you know, one thing I would say, I mean, complexity is, I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I do think that AI can be helpful in terms of dealing with complexity and especially with the city. I mean, it's such a, I mean, so many factors that uh, have to be addressed that, you know, I think takes it way beyond what humans can really grasp. So that's my view of that. But my question would be whether complex um, questions necessarily lead to complex forms. I mean, I'm thinking here about um, the simple soap bubble. And actually, it, it is from uh, maybe things have changed, but uh, uh, certainly a few years ago, computationally, you couldn't really model the simple soap bubble because it was so complex. Um, and yet it's a sphere, you know, it's, it's a kind of simple sphere. And we have in architecture a lot of, you know, very complex forms, sometimes many of them sort of generated using, I don't know, processing or quite straightforward algorithms and whether indeed um, we need to have complex forms responding to complexity. I don't know whether I, whether I could ask Daniel to kind of to comment on, on, on that issue. Um, um, well, depends, I think, um, because I, we, we are all used to this kind of idea of um, complex systems are mostly generated by simple, simple rules. So usually you have a simple rule plus simple rule that uh, that leads them to a complex in a way behavior. And most of the time, if you do it like a complex rule plus complex rule, you end up with chaos most of the time. Yeah? So in a way, this is a, a, a sort of um, at the core of, of this idea of complex systems. So they are mostly, mostly, sorry, my, my cat is crying in the back. Uh, so um, they're, they're in a way, uh, they, they are uh, organized by this kind of simpler rules. Yeah? So when it comes to complexity, how you address complexity, uh, I think that's, that's quite, uh, quite, quite a challenge. Um, I understand, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, he's very, very uh, active this morning. Um, so uh, what I was saying, sorry. Um, so when, when it comes to complexity, um, and you're saying simple questions, you're trying to, to put a sim simple question, but uh, the um, soap bubble, it's a very complex problem that you, can, you barely can uh, describe it in a way. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, doesn't, necessarily it doesn't necessarily lead to a complex form. That's I guess my point is. Oh. But what is interesting, I mean, if you start with just uh, the physical requirements of structure for instance or environmental so all the engineering logics um what you'll find is that the simple even the simple seemingly simple task of a you know a beam stretching between two points and maybe with a cantilever there's already in, in terms of optimization you you, you will have a it, a relatively complex form, it's still not chaotic. Um, you know, like the moment line, for instance, or the, the all these kind of beautiful catenary uh, uh, f forms, tensor forms, minimal forms. I mean, they are they are the, of that order that even in a simple setup, you generate already something which is more complex than what a non-computationally aided architecture was able to look at. And if you think about the notion of, and for me, it's still order, you know, complex variegated order. And if you think about uh, something like Le Corbusier, at that period, order was always only the straight line, the right angle, the grid. And he was dismissive of uh, older city plans because he didn't understand their rationality you know, he was dismissive of, you know, he thought man would impose his order, which is the order of the straight line of geometry and dismissive of the donkey's pass of least resistant. And, and now we're realizing that the donkey's pass isn't a random, you know, scatter. It's, it's actually a, a computation, which in the end has, 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 more, uh, has a more intricate order. And I think the breakthrough here is, of course, through the uh, complexity theory um, and then for something like for auto-material computation. That's only on the physical side of things already. 
And that's what paramedicine picks up. But we should also, I think what was so important to recognize on the, uh, the, the, the real purposes finally, to, let's say to, to frame and facilitate social processes, they have become more complex. You know, they, they, they were relatively simple and repetitive processes in, in, in older, at older times. Uh, the number of, um, you know, people involved, uh, the, the differentiation uh, was only into a handful of different uh, status groups and, and a lot of sameness. So, so that has changed in terms of, first of all, the, 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 the participating population is much more variegated and differentiated and also the various components, the division of labor between various elements and aspects and offerings in an urban context, as well as within each building, you know, these kind of mixed use uh, conditions. Uh, there we have um, two things. We have the, the, the great diversity of elements and we have the, the, the proximity of these in, in kind of a lot of synergetic combinations. So, and, so and this is complexity, which, is, which needs to be somehow handled, understood and translated. And of course, if you have, um, you have the architectural recipes of ordering were falling short. And when that was first discovered was actually Christopher Alexander said, the city is not a tree. And, uh, or Jane Jacobs, these kind of the figures who realized that there's, there, were, there have been processes and also Bill Hillier, the sociological of space, they realized that there, before modernism and central planning, uh, uh, you, there was a process of trial and error, quasi natural evolutionary process of accruing something more complex, which would have to be understood rather than dismissed. And, and I think that's the paradigm shift. And, and now we are attempting to um, participate in that um, process and facilitate that. I still believe, and that's my belief still, that we can't, we're not at a position as yet to, to simulate a whole uh, city development because yeah. we don't have the relevant information. So there was a fallacy in the, you know, there was in the 70s what, what, what the tri in terms of market process where they thought they can, they can, they can simulate them on a, on a computer in, 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 in Chile in the 1970s. So I still believe that we need to have a, an open social process. And that's why I was saying multi-author way. But each of these authors, each of these clients comes in equipped with a lot of um, more data, with a lot of calculational power to do their fragments and fit their fragments into a local condition. But you can't uh, substitute for that, that social process where all these local interventions highly geared up with artificial intelligence as computational power, uh, but the overall still no. That's why I think it's also important to realize that, that there are, we shouldn't have this kind of dream of an overall, I mean, anyway, not yet and not in, during our lifetimes, substitution of an artificial intelligence for, for that, let's say, social process intelligence. But as I said, again, it's very important. It's the same as with markets. If you look at uh, um, processes like the stock market and, and various trading strategies and funds and all corporates, they all have, they're highly, they have a highly sophisticated data sets and models and computational to, to make the individual decision. And that's important for the overall rationality, but there's still something about the, uh, the, the impossibility to centralize the overall. That, yeah. That's something important to, to, to point out. So that complexity um, is, is, is beyond simulation or reach. I give you an example about complexity and simpleness, so to say, not uh, the politician way of thinking. All the uh, right wing people are following very simple uh, wordings because our complexity is, like I said, is hardly to understand. Look, this is a Felton. I just, can you see it? No. Can you see that? Yeah. Now yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is the falcon. The falcon is hunting gooses. And because of a, 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 
uh, optimizing and efficiency, the goose only sees this simple sign when it sees the falcon. Simplifying a complex system. And I think we should overthink that, that we are going to optimize and uh, optimizing everything the people as well, yeah, optimize your body, <laughs> optimize your brain and work efficiently, yeah, make sex efficiently, <laughs> all these things. It's crazy. It's really crazy. No, but, uh, but, but Wolf, I'm not talking about this. I think what, yeah, you I know, know, what, uh, you know what, what I find important is to realize the, the default condition is now, you know, differentiation variation and that might be yes, not yes, yes, yes. not 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 with, with little knowledge so remember that you know this idea of virtuality so you generate instead of doing a, a regular grid you do something highly uh, varied with with with, with hot spots squeezes expansions and you do that without mm -hmm. knowledge just as a matrix of for self-sorting, even under these conditions, I think. Um, or I'm not saying that the optimization, that you can optimize all of it, but there is some kind of a new default matrix, which is more of a kind of parametrically differentiated matrix. And, and that doesn't mean that we know what in advance, how everybody slots into all these different conditions, we still rely, and that's what I was saying earlier, we're still relying on a self-sorting in freedom. We need Not individual really freedom. To, to, and, and for me, these are matrices of a new type of a, a better freedom. So you have that freedom of the Manhattan grid. Yeah. And, and, and I think we can have a, free, a freedom of settling into a, a much more uh, variegated parametric the three-dimensional network kind of no longer grid, but it still relies on, and we, we, we still don't, it's not an you know advanced optimization. It's something which then needs to have a set, you know, the kind of social process of appropriation. Uh, but I think the grid isn't, isn't, isn't the default matrix. It's, an, it's some, kind of thing, some kind of uh, intricately differentiated network. Uh, Patrick, okay, okay, uh, I agree. <laughs> but, but you know, I don't want to be misunderstood. I try, as, make, as, yeah, as, yeah, yeah. I, may, I try to make it simple. If we architects, as far as I understand my profession, we are experts because we studied for years, 50 years. We are experts to create space which works, could work in different ways. But now people are moving in, occupying uh, uh, our field by using the same expressions we are using it and we are not fighting back. That means we are losing our competence that we are expert uh, um, to create spaces, not only sp little spaces, but cityscapes, so to say, because we are studying that for, for, for 50 years, in my case, 53, 55 years. So now people come in with all these digitized uh, uh, tablets and, and, and values and numbers. They are 32 years old and they think they can do it the same way. No way, no way, this is like, uh, you cannot be expert in, in the space traveling without training. And if we are, uh, we are dilettants on the way of uh, social process because we didn't study it, we are dilettants on many other things because we are not experts. We are experts in creating three-dimensional uh, environments and lovely ones, as you can see at, at the building at where um, uh, Patrick is sitting there. Look, he's going uh, natural as well because the columns looking like trees. Uh, maybe they're producing CO2 
as well, sooner or later, it will be. But what I like is Daniel sitting um, uh, behind, uh, uh, in front of uh, AI uh, uh, image, and I sitting, the image behind of uh, me is a building, building it's the Mokabe Museum in Shenzhen. It's funny. So this is complex. I, I, complex is not easy to understand. And actually there are some brain uh, guys who said we will never be able to think in complex ways because our brain is not made for it. I mean, uh, I think that uh, you, your building is fantastic, by the way, I've been there. And you know what it is? It's these themes, you know, where you have an open space, uh, but it's structured. It's not a vast yeah, 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 space. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, as you said, it's a Piranesi. Uh, uh, and Baroque, which is interesting. For me, these two phrases is exactly what I'm aspiring to. You have the complexity and depth and layeredness and, and labyrinthine quality of a Piranesi, and then you use a Baroque to, to, to regain a foothold and legibility within this, and the beauty. So, because the Piranesi is, a, is an image of menace, you know, of the dungeon of, the, of hell. And Baroque is, you know, so the synthesis of Piranesi and Boromnini is exactly what we need, but it is the new generic condition because we need these spaces yeah. like this one here. Mine is, is also a kind of the, the yeah, Piranesi yeah. Uh, elevated through a kind of Baroque uh, articulation, because that's the kind of that's the contemporary spaces where you have things above, below, all around in layers at your fingertips, and you get a sense what's going on, intervisibility, interawareness, in in that kind of network, and you can also find niches and. So, and they, they, oh, there are many oh. different versions of this. And, oh, they, oh. and you see, they don't, they work, they work even with, you know, you can't actually pre-tailor every corner. It's just the kind of, you, you, you broadly tailor with the main inflows and outflows and the side constraints and where's the big opening and where's the smaller, the five, the 50 small openings. That's the way you do it. But it doesn't mean that it's more oppressive Let's say you little cannot say we do, you know a lot of this is gratuitous, uh, but it's not random. It follows a principle, and the principle is the Baroque Piranesi. So we can say <laughs> you know, the we are drawing wrong perspectives. Yeah, this is one thing I like very much. And the dungeon is not the topic; it's just the freedom to make everything wrong in his uh, drawings. And Baroque, I like that. Uh, what I like actually, Patrick, you are using the word for open societies, trial and error. This is very, this is very, I'm astonished. I like that, <laughs> to be honest, because the same word is uh, we always use, everyone is right, but nothing is correct. But what I wanted to say, Baroque, I'm in favor um, in Baroque because they are, they are building tons of material to shape a cupola, tons of material. And then they, they ordered the painter to paint it away by painting the heaven. If I mean, what comes to mind, you mentioned cupola. Derrida. You mentioned Derrida, right? So, uh, so, so what I've learned of it, and then, and, you know, so we learn something from David and Eisenman and we, we, I'm incorporated in my thinking. So, because, because you know, there's no notion of difference, you know, that, that system of differences that has a complexity that what each element meaning is its position in a network of differences. Now, but then these differences are not non-static. They keep shifting. So the identity of the element also keeps migrating and shifting. And that's the kind of condition which in spatial terms is the space of becoming what, what Eisman was, what, the way he's phrased it. And I think that's also, the spaces we are generating are, you know, have different effects, they're spaces of becoming, and without complexity, there's none of this. If you have, you know, a, a, a simple course, square with, 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 with an axial address to the cathedral, and then there's a town on the left and the market on the right, three elements on a, on, on, a, on a square or circle, there is no difference, there is no becoming, there is no complexity. So, and, but I think what is fascinating to me is that on, on the spatial terms, as is, yeah, Christopher Alexander has seen that. So he has 
he's drawn okay. these kind of network diagrams, okay. but he then had a visual metaphor. And the visual metaphor is that, is that space of visual becoming, you know, that kind of these, these yeah. ambiguous figures where the Gestalt switch is happening. But the interesting thing is in the Crystal Alexander image, it's not a switch between the two, vases, uh, the two faces and the vase, it's a switch between literally 21 readings. There's this kind of migration and I'm working in it, if you, if you three dimensionalize that, um, in, in terms of your observer position, you, 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 you get at something and you can, you can generate that. Um, and that's the gestalt. You, in your work, and actually you can do that unconsciously, subconsciously, or let the abstract machine of, of, the, of your ADA generate something. It nearly, it nearly always will produce this kind of, this difference effect, the space of becoming, the, the richness yeah, of okay. readings. And that, but but only premise on complexity, uh, and that's why I think, and, and, and that's what, and then you don't need to know in advance. Variety a, is not complexity, Patrick. You know, everyone is talking about complexity, and no one, including me, knows really what complexity means. Because I believe my friend, he says we are not able to. Um, to think in a complex way because our brain is, until now, not yet able to, uh, to do it because we never, uh, never uh, uh, need to use it, complexity. Like the, uh, the, the, you know, the zebras and the, the buffaloes are caught by the crocodile because they don't know that there is a danger because it's not worth that the brain uh, was developed that way that they see a danger in the river because they are crocodiles, because they're only twice a yeah, year. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, yeah. uh, the wolf. I think yeah. that's what, what, what Christopher Alexander is saying. So if you, so for instance, if you close your eyes and you're just trying to think an idea and a composition, it will be that simple. And that's, but if that's why, you know, the surrealists already realized that's why you need to kind of shift away or the losing abstract machines or the way, the, you know, formal process like Eisman. You have to have then alien processes where, where we are, we have to hand over the creative process to maybe auto, this kind of surrealist doodling like Zaha was doing, or you do a little, you run an algorithm, or you do, you, 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 you do a kind of Max Ernst job. Of frottage and decalque manier, and but then when we look back at this, a different part of our brain comes in, which is this kind of the phonological, yeah, the course. reading machine, which yeah. is very different, which is an intuitive gestalt reading machine. That's where we're very fertile. When we are thinking and trying to generate something, uh, uh, in like like in a, in a in a kind of rational, deliberate way, we are we are we are dead. Uh, dead in the water. That's why we need these artistic, let's say, uh, detours. But then we come in and we have a kind of pattern recognition gestalt thing, which is which which needs to then become activated. That's the way. I, and 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 I think that's been some, the big discovery. I think methodologically in the discipline in the 1980s. Anyway, that's where I grew up into that when I started. Yeah, that was know, a big discovery. Yeah, um, no, yeah, but I listen to you because this is a, a different uh, level, n not a higher, no, a different field, I would say. And I still think that people don't know, uh, especially the, the uh, guys from the United States, they don't accept that um, Derrida was very strongly influenced by the theory of the subconscious, um, uh, which plays a big role in our life. And what I like, I have to say, and if you read that, um, he proves it on a text of Kleist, I think, that Kleist was um, um, talking uh, very badly. Uh, Kleist would be a me too guy nowadays, yeah, because this sentence uh, of, uh, offers that he is hunting women or he had a bad meaning about women, they are bad and things like that. I like that there's a point of uh, departure, so to say, 
which is different to all the rationalizing, the, the way of rationalizing. I think it, it's a very, all these rationalizing techniques are very helpful to create uh, a new kind of um, space envelope, which gives us the possibility to uh, work and think and live in a, a more open way, open way than nowadays. What I would like to say that architecture, we always say architecture has no influence in things. If I go to the school, my former school, rebuilt by, by uh, uh, really uh, um, mediocre architect, I can prove that architecture cannot support human beings to getting better, but architecture can prohibit to develop, uh, to, uh, to develop your imagination by looking at these black painted walls with uh, tableaus where you can read, this is the Verwaltung and three names, and this is the studio, three names, looks like a ministry. I'm wondering how much uh, resistance students have to develop to survive in this environment and bring new ideas into the world. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Listen, guys, I have to, and, and my time is uh, running short a little bit. Should, if, if there's any... Um, um, there's a question. I have another I mean, 10 minutes or something. Yeah, there's a question um, from uh, uh, Dr. Shima Beiji. I don't know if Shima, you'd like to, um, if you can, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Apologies for the voice, uh, for the noises in background. Uh, my question is for Patrick, uh, please. Um, and it's about simple question. Um, well, first of all, I'm coming from a background of complexity. I'm a complexity scientist and also smart city researcher. And, um, and I was looking at the beautiful designs that you were presenting. The question that was in my mind was that, how can you, uh, what is the solution or the, um, the strategy that you offer for uh, actually filling these beautiful buildings with beautiful people? Because I feel, because I think, I mean, well, from um, complexity perspective, yes, kind of, I can argue that, but also from um, the right to the city of uh, Lefebvre argument, I think design should have continuity. And I think, and I was wondering, what is, how do you think about this question? What are your thoughts? How can these designs, beautiful designs, really trigger our um, higher kind of attitudes, such as empathy, such as love, such as caring for each other, such, such as really becoming curious, because I, I wonder if beautification of buildings can hijack, like the image that um, uh, Wolf uh, had from this image of God's touching screen, hijacking human creativity and putting it into design and pretending kind of like a placebo that because we are living in beautiful buildings, therefore we are good people, we have evolved. So I was wondering how can that really beauty, how that external, like externalization of beauty can, can invite people to, to really become more inclusive, more beautiful as human beings. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, first of all, I think the, the, the uh, if you look at uh, a building and you perceive um, beauty, I mean, that means something. Uh, my uh, belief through all my own self-reflection, but also through what I'm trying to, to understand about the notion of beauty is some anticip anticipation of a beautiful life, a, a something which is uh, uplifting and facilitating and you expect, you know, it, it gives you an expectation about uh, how you could live and occupy such a structure and how it would empower it and allow for beautiful encounters and meetings and interactions. I think that's what we're, we're looking for when we, when we, you know, when you see, a, I mean, it's the most obvious and easy to understand if you see these wonderful kind of case study houses in Los Angeles or so, you, you, the way they launched that openness and you can, you, you imagine yourself to be there with, with maybe with your girlfriend or with friends and 
what what the you know the kind of parties you could have is spilling out on the terrace and so on. So, so these interactions, I think they, they're there. That's what we what I believe is beauty. Beauty is um, uh, an anticipation of that beautiful interaction, social, because we're highly social creatures and. And it's the same with the city. That's thrill. I mean, I was I, I was living. Uh, I was brought up in the in the kind of provinces, of, you know, very kind of a bit kind of boring and dead uh, uh, suburbs. <laughs> and there's a thrill about city life, and the city buzz. And it also you see it already when you see the complexity of a structure. I, it still happens to me when I'm, I'm, I'm when I'm approaching Manhattan from from JFK. There's some kind of exciting about it because it, you've associated with with the life. So that's the first thing uh, to say, and but it also then needs to really sustain that life. You know, there's something, uh, there's some, con co you know, causal connection between that kind of density of a and, and 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 differentiation of a Manhattan skyline and what happens out on the street and the multiplicity of encounters and, and facilities and people you get, uh, and also to do with the scale. So so and similarly, um, I do believe that. You know, you shouldn't play beauty against function. Uh, you know, the beauty is what we perceive and, and a recognition uh, in us intuitive of uh, the morphologies which sustain this kind of social function. And then we associate it with it. And uh, so, so, so in, in these buildings, I do believe that, so it's important that even to attract that audience, to bring in those um, let's say firms or companies or, or individuals to a district who, who have that desire to, to be part of something and they can see themselves and they can see the sense of density, the sense of connection, the, the, the intimacy of various spaces and they're also the, the atmosphere of something very contemporary and that actually draws people together. So I've showed you this one of our Moscow projects, it's a multi-tenant uh, kind of cluster of firms and and you can see that that's actually a synergy machine. And actually it's quite magically that you can imagine that a lot of uh, this young firms and, 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 and hip firms who, who, who were relevant to each other all find the same space. They have a similar sensibility in what they're looking for. And then you gather in that place. It's a bit like, you know, um, you, you navigate the city and which kind of restaurant or club or bar you go to, there, there's, there's something which, which, which speaks to you. And that's what we're hoping in these projects. And, but, but also there's this, you know, the moment of variety, there's a moment of, let's say, intervisibility and transparency. I think that every company wants, that's something in the air. That's what you need. It's not so much about you want something where you can be close the door and be away for, go down that corridor or in, on that floor and you don't, you're in the building with 5,000 people, but you don't see any. And you want that privacy. Maybe that's what you want in a residential project, but you don't want that in these kind of, um, let's say, urban incubator projects. And I think that speaks to you. You can anticipate. We then go a step further and be running these, you know, agent-based simulations to get the sense of in the, the, the in various versions where you get in a higher frequency of encounter. And that has a lot to do with then more also the programming, where you place the meeting zones, where you place entrances, where do you place, you know, how do you hierarchize uh, the, the, the spaces and so on. So, so that's the answer to that. Um, the beauty is just, um, um, you know, we, this is, is, is the intuitive recognition of that beautiful life. Um, okay, thank you very much. A very interesting answer. Um, final comment, have you, um, I imagine that you're familiar with the uh, flow theory, psychological theory of flow from uh, Csikszentmihalyi. I think he was a psychologist at Harvard University. So I was wondering if you tried- Yes, yes, I'm quite familiar with flow theory, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking that if you've tried, if you've ever kind of been uh, imagining or trying to connect some of these designs that you have and the impact on the generation of flow, like social flow or individual flow, or how can we actually, because when, when we think of complexity, it's very important to understand that the pattern emerges from the interaction, interactions of agents at the very micro level. So I mean, are you absolutely really right? Kind of I think, that, you know, you know, when I find myself being the flow is precisely in seminars like this in, in, in a social setting, 
we're, 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 you know, we're, we're actually, I'm generating all these new ideas. In these, in, within, in the midst of the se uh, uh, seminar, you know, within the, within the lecture, I'm generating new stuff. So that's flow. And you're quite right. It's, it's, an, it's a phenomenon of an individual sense of empowerment, but it comes through the stimulation of being part of something. Be, you know, having anticipations of be, having kind of questions thrown at me, and and, and really yeah. seeing what you know what what Wolf is saying, and 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 suddenly have a new element. I'm now talking about you know, uh, let's say, or you know, I pick up from Wolf talking about the, the Baroque Piranesi, and and so so that's flow, and to and and the supercomputer up here <laughs> with these billions of neurons, this association weaving. I think that's in that heightened heightened state of alertness, of openness, of ener being energized uh, to, to learn and contribute back. That's what I think these buildings can do. Uh, exactly. And, I think, this, kind of, and, and I think that's why I believe these, uh, and that's what we need to do in the, in, the, in the 21st century. And it's no longer the kind of, uh, the, you know, the um, La Tourette, the kind of ascetic self, uh, you know, brooding, brooding kind of uh, uh, autistic final final comment uh, it's kind of like these can be used as a it, as if they can be used for a scaffolding of uh, social experience social experience and also steering collective intelligence uh, attention toward a generation of a uh, higher degree of uh, social capital creative capital in cities because a really big part of creating a smart community is about um, creating higher degrees of ideas and complexity parts of complexity is to generate uh, uh, critical uh, masses of individuals or parts to that are able to 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 give rise to orders such as sustainability, such as action toward climate change. So it's much more easier to really shift collective behavior to, toward um, things that we, we are discussing right now in 21st century, such as inclusivity, and the fight against discrimination. So I think these kinds of buildings and designs can be kind of um, setting the, set the scene or scaffold the, the conversation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Oh. Absolutely, I agree with that. Wolf, do you like to comment at all? Or you... Two comments, um, three actually. One is, uh, one is, um, I, I like to read from the psychoanalyst from, and he says, if the mankind is delegate the lifeliness to machines, it's the expression of the dead of a dead wish. This is whether it's true or not. It's uh, we have to think about that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if I would be the dean of a school, mm -hmm. I would like to exclude no, no. the theorists, uh, the art historian, the philosopher, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, guys who are arranging exhibitions for five years not to teach and leave the kids alone that they come back to the main issue of architecture. All this talk, all these talks is very dilettantic. I refer to uh, guys who knows about the brain and they say, <laughs> You know, my, my friend compares the brain of a, of a fly with, the, with the, the ability of working with the biggest computer of the world, the largest one. And he said, this guy, namely the computer, is dreaming of the possibilities the brain of a fly has um, making decision in milli, milli, milli seconds. To, in order to survive. Uh, this is, this, it, it, sometimes it needs a very skeptical approach to our field in order to reorganize all the things to get ready uh, to have uh, Patrick as a, as a mayor of London. <laughs> <laughs> 
guys, I gotta run. I'm very sorry. And I have another meeting, which is over. Uh, We're already too. late. I, honestly, me too. Good, good nice to see day. you guys. Yeah, Thanks. see you soon, Patrick. Bye -bye. In Russia. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are doing a lot of buildings there. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a good place. Yeah. All right. Bye. Thanks, Don't Patrick. Thanks, my pleasure. Th thanks, Patrick. Let's let's we'll, we'll uh, that's a fantastic contribution, and thank you, Shima, for your question. Let's wrap things things up. Um, I don't know, if, Paul. If there's one final thing to say. I mean, uh, we we last week we were caught up a little bit. We made the award of the opening ceremony about uh, for your deep Himmelblau um, uh, uh, project. Is there any final comments you might want to say about the deep Himmelblau as a kind of way forward? No, no. I think it's it's the next step. Yeah. Not not in order to replace the Im imagination, but um, what I found out, if I look at the, 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 the images of created by uh, Deep Himmelblau, that we have to investigate research for new materials. I think we architects cannot do it, but we have to force the building industry or the industry to work on that because yeah, what we are doing, we are building little structures in a little courtyard of the schools. And then after the exhibition is over, everything is over. There, we have to get political power in order to command the building industry to think in a more, more creative way about building things in a economic way because I know that everyone wants to make money and money makes the, uh, makes the world go around. But it's very important that our creativity, the creativity of our brain and of our social emotional thinking is still there and not depressed by big leaders or machines or whatever. This is uh, one of the sentences I always say to, to students, watch out and carry on. <laughs> thank so you. In, in I have to leave as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Will. Thank you. That was really amazing. We, we, as we say, you can keep calm and carry on, but thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, so, I mean, just to say we're kind of wrapping up now, but tomorrow uh, we have the closing ceremony, um, which is going to be a remarkable um, uh, event in itself. So um, it'll be starting one hour before we start this session, so it'll, it'll be a bit earlier. Thank you, Wolf, for that. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for helping to set this up. And thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Shima. And above all, I want to thank the team b b who's been supporting this behind the scenes. Uh, unbelievable work, all done by volunteers, and an incredible gesture to try and democratize education and open things up in the way that we have that has happened so thank you so much for the team behind it and thank you also to the team that has been um the, the theory group that's organizing this particular series uh marina rodriguez as neves uh, uh victoria luisa barbo and uh, sanford quinta for all the contributions um this has been amazing all these events will be uploaded onto onto our channel um, where you can um, have a look at them afterwards, um, hopefully without having to go and log on to do so. Um, so thank you so much and uh, look forward to the next step in our discussion um, uh, tomorrow when we kind of wrap things up. And uh, I just want to, as a final, final comment to thank all those workshop, the other workshop leaders who have been contributing their time uh, to to this thing. I, I went to the, the session l last night, the review, yesterday, yesterday, the review of the work that Daniel Manos and, and Shamin have been put together. And I've seen many other things, some incredible work that's coming out of this. Let's see what we can do to build upon this uh, in terms of trying to really think about how we can take it to this next level in trying to democratize education and, and use this platform to open up debates in this kind. It was wonderful to have all of you contributing today from all over the world, literally all over the world and from different disciplines. So uh, thank you so much for today and uh, see you all um, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.